Hopefully all of you are doing very well. Today we will discuss about the multinational managerial finance and I am Dr. Sharad Kandoka who will give this lecture today. So what is a multinational corporation or MNC? So the multinational corporations are those corporations which operate more than two countries simultaneously and that is called the multinational corporation. So if you look into some definition of the multinational corporation, this will be a multinational corporation has facilities and other assets in at least one country other than its home country. Such companies have offices and factories in different countries and usually have centralized head office where they coordinate global management. Now, multinational corporations sometimes are also referred as the transnational and international or the stateless corporation. So, the multinational corporation has office more than one country than the home country. So, it can operate in different places around the globe. So, think about Mercedes Benz. Think about Toyota. Think about Microsoft Corporation. So, all of these are international corporations. So we can also treat them as the multinational corporation as well. So what are the reasons for a firm going international? Now there are several factors. That's why the firm wants to go to the international to get the opportunity to go to the international market and use the cheap labor, raw materials and the existing new technology. So the main factors includes going internationals are number one seek the new market think about going to a new market think about a firm which is located in australia or the usa would like to expand its business to the asian market and they will have the perfect opportunity to create a business rather than exporting the goods from australia or from the usa because it will be expensive for the Asian market. So set up a company in a local market in Asian country, for example, in Bangladesh or in Vietnam and seek for a new market. Now this will also help the multinational corporation to seek raw materials and that raw material will be cheaper than from the home country. They can seek new technology. For example, if the new multinational corporation goes to a technological oriented country for example to Japan they can also seek the production efficiency because large scale of production can be possible through the multinational corporation and if we look the large multinational corporation we'll see that they have product efficiency and the cost of production is below the other competitors and sometimes it also helps to avoid political and regulatory hurdle. So these are the main factors of a firm going international. There are basically four different categories of multinational corporations. Number one, a decentralized corporation with a strong presence in its home country. For example, think uh, Audi or Mercedes Benz. It's a multinational corporation but has a strong presence in its home country. The second type of multinational corporation is a global centralized corporation that acquires cost advantages where the cheap resources are available. Think about the Apple. So this could be an example for this second category. The third category is a global company that builds on a parent's corporation's R&D. For example, think about General Motors. The General Motors or the GM is located in the USA, but it has other companies or it also has uh, some other subsidiaries across the globe. Think about the Holden Australia. The Holden Australia is a part of GM and it is based on the parents' corporations R&D. So the Holden, the car the Holden produced are also sold in European countries, but it, the name change. 
because it's the GM company car. And number four is the transitional enterprise that uses all three categories. So this is the fourth category of the multinational corporation. In this slide, we can see the 10 largest multinational corporations across the globe. So let's look at it. So number one is the Walmart and the total size of their asset is $485 billion. Toyota, number fifth, they have the asset of $254 billion. Volkswagen Group, as I mentioned earlier, $240 billion. Apple, $215 billion. And ExxonMobil, $205 billion. So what are the, the main difference between the multinational corporation and the domestic firms? So there are six factors that distinguishes the multinational corporation from a domestic firm. Number one, different currencies denominations because the multinational corporations deal with several currencies. For example, think about the Apple or think of Volkswagen because they have production facility across the globe. Therefore, they need to deal with different currencies. So this is number one. Whereas the domestic firm, it only deals with one currency. Second, economic and the legal aspect. Because the structure of the multinational corporation is more complicated than domestic firm. Domestic firm only need to look after the legal aspect of their home country, whereas the multinational corporation, they need to deal with the legal aspect of several other countries. For example, think about the Facebook. Now, Facebook is currently facing some challenges from the European Union. And before, they faced some uh, critical situation in USA as well, because they need to deal with several legal factors. The language difference is the third factors of distinguishing the multinational corporation with the domestic firm. The multinational corporation, their main language is in English, because English is the international language. However, the language they used in their factory or their organization could be different across the globe. But they have a common language and that is the English. They also deal with the cultural differences. For example, think about the cultural differences in China and Japan and with the US and the Western world. Multinational corporation, they always face these differences. They also need to deal with the role of the government because some government have different policies for the multinational corporations. And they always face more political risk than the domestic firm. Because the multinational corporations are large organizations and they have operation across the globe, so they face more political risk than the local firms. The exchange rate risk is a big factor for the multinational corporation because they always need to deal with several currencies. So the exchange rate is basically the price of one currency expressed in terms of another currency. And as we know, the most currencies are quoted against the US dollar because the US dollar is the global currency or it's also known as the base currency. In the currency market, all currencies are quoted against basically against the US dollar. So how it happens? For example, one unit of US dollar is equivalent of 122.65 Japanese yen. So this quotation means that if someone want to buy one US dollar from Japan, they need to spend 122.65 yen to buy one US dollar. And if they want to convert it, or if they want to convert one US dollar, they will receive 122.65 yen. Now, remember, because for the multinational corporation, uh, 
they always need to deal with different currencies so they always need to deal with the appreciation and the depreciation of the currency when we say the appreciation or the depreciation of currency it basically means how one currency is appreciating against the base currency or the other currency for example think about that the Australian dollar in recently is depreciating against the US dollar if you go back around 2009 you will find that one Australian dollar was buying almost more than one US dollar but if you look at 2019 one Australian dollar is buying around around 65 to 70 US cents so Australian dollar depreciated against the US currency now this appreciation or depreciation always happening for example uh, let's look at to the slide say before one US dollar was purchasing 1.4680 Swiss franc now one US dollar is purchasing 1.471 Swiss franc so it means that the US dollar appreciated against this particular currency and now worth 0.003 Swiss franc more against the opposite currency so when we know about the exchange rate when we know about the appreciation and depreciation of the exchange rate we also need to think about what is called spot rate and the cross rate the spot rate is in the currency market that what is the in spot we're going to get uh, against the another currency or the base currency and the cross rate is is the rate which derived from two different currencies exchange rate for example if one US dollar for example one Australian dollar is buying 0.7250 US dollar and one US dollar is buying uh, 1.4610 Swiss franc what is the cross rate of US Australian dollar in terms of Swiss franc so that's what we need to, ca need to calculate so the cross rate would be for one Australian dollar against the Swiss franc is given that one Australian dollar is purchasing 0.7250 US dollar and one US dollar is purchasing 1.3797.93 Australian dollar and one US dollar is purchasing 1.4610 Swiss franc then one Australian dollar should be purchasing 1.4 so 1.3793 Australian dollar should be purchasing 1.4610 Swiss franc. So if you do the calculation, then you will find that one Australian dollar, if you divide 1.4610 by 1.3793, then you will find that one Australian dollar is actually purchasing. 1.0592 Swiss franc. Why don't you take out your calculator and look at to the cross rate? Now this is a very interesting calculation for you. So let's check out what is the current Australian dollar worth in the market against the US dollar. Let, and then also check out what is the worth of Swiss franc against the US dollar and then try to find out what is the cross rate at today's price. Now in this calculation we find that one Australian dollar is purchasing 1.0592 Swiss franc. So if I ask you the question again that what is the cross rate for Swiss franc in terms of Australian dollar? So one Swiss franc is purchasing about 0.9441 Australian dollar. Now this is how we we'll calculate the cross rate. When we look into the international monetary system, we can find there are different types of monetary system across the globe. And we need to know 
some of the terms. For example, forward exchange rate. A forward exchange rate is a rate agreed today at which one currency is sold or brought against another for the delivery on a specific future date which is later than the spot rate. So spot rate is the rate you are you are fixing a rate today for example and the forward exchange rate you are thinking about a rate which will be delivery or specified in a future date. So what is the spot rate? So the spot rate is the price quoted for immediate settlement on a commodity or security or a currency. So spot is called the rate for today for example on the spot on the moment. So the quotation for the spot. So if you look at the exchange rate system across the globe, there are basically four different exchange rate system we can see now. Number one is called the fixed exchange rate. Number two is called the freely floating exchange rate. Number three, managed float. And number four, target zone arrangement. So we look each of the exchange rate system in our lecture. So the first is the fixed exchange rate system. So the exchange rate is fixed and determined by the government. Now several, several academic suggest there are few countries which fix their exchange rate system. Now any disequilibrium in exchange rate will be lead to government intervention. So the government would like to make sure the exchange rate is fixed against a major currency. For example, that currency XYZ uh, is fixed against the US dollar. So if you look at to, uh, the historical exchange rate for any particular country, you'll find that if it's a fixed rate, then this currency is not moving against the base currency that much. It might have a fluctuation, but it's not over the time it's very very minimum and in this equilibrium in exchange rate the government will intervene so this is called the fixed exchange rate a good example could be for a uh, good example could be uh, us dollar against the russian currency so the russian ruble during the soviet era during the soviet era uh, one US dollar was equivalent of one Soviet currency which is called the Soviet ruble and interestingly when the Soviet Union collapsed during the 1990s their currency collapsed as well and it, it basically happened because it was a fixed exchange rate system in Soviet Union. So the fixed rate could be for the gold, could be for the specific currency or could be for the basket of currencies. The second exchange rate system uh, is called uh, the freely floating exchange rate system. So rate is determined by the market forces, that is the supply and demand for the currency without the government intervention. For example, the Australian currency is a freely floating exchange rate system. Advantages is has a monetary independence, so the currency is actually determined by the demand and supply in the market and exchange rate should reflect the value of the currency. However, uh, one of the biggest problem of the freely floating exchange rate system is the rates fluctuate over the time randomly. So think about Australian dollar against the US currency. US dollar and Australian currency is fluctuating over the period from, two, from 2009 till 2019. If you look at this last 10 years, Australian dollar fluctuated heavily against the US currency. So this is one of the big problem of the freely floating exchange rate system. Therefore, sometimes the government try to intervene in order to make sure that there is enough demand and supply in the market. And that's called the dirty float. So fixed and floating exchange rate system, if you look at here, you can understand by this slide. So this slide is shown, this part is showing the fixed exchange rate. Okay, and this is showing uh, the supply of one particular currency and the demand of one particular currency. So the quantity of British pound per period. So you can see here the supply and the demand 
is actually fixing the exchange rate. So this is uh, the British currency against the US dollar. So if you look at in here, the, when the supply line moves, moves down, then the exchange rate also declines because of the demand goes down. Okay, but the fixed rate doesn't really matter whether you change supply or demand doesn't really matter because it's always fixed against the dollar, against the currency. Now, in this slide, it shows the Australian dollar and the US dollar exchange rate from 2001 till 2011. So, if you look at it here, that uh, this is the Australian dollar, is how it is fluctuating against the US dollar. So during 2001, one Australian dollar was purchasing 0.5 uh, US cent. Around 2009, it uh, around it, it, it became uh, 70 and 80. Uh, around 2008, it became about more than 90 US cent. And then around 2011, one Australian dollar was purchasing more than one American dollar. So this is one of the biggest problem of freely floating exchange rate, whereas you look at the fixed exchange rate, it is fixed. So what is the managed float? So this is another exchange rate system. So the rate is determined by the market, but occasionally with the central bank intervention to smooth out the large fluctuations. So one exchange rate system might, can have a freely floating exchange rate system, but occasionally the central bank can might intervene in order to remove uh, any big fluctuation of the currency rates. Now, this is between the freely floated exchange rate and the fixed exchange rate system, and this is called the dirty floating. So, what is the ideal exchange rate system? So, the ideal exchange rate system attributes includes exchange rate stability, full financial integration, and the monetary independence. However, this is to note that it is not possible for any particular exchange rate system to have all three attributes. And it's not possible to achieve all three attributes at the same time. So when we talk about the other exchange rate system, the next thing which will come to our mind is the foreign exchange risk. Because for the multinational corporation, dealing with the different currencies always bring some risk for the organization. So the foreign exchange rate measures the potential for the firm's profitability, the net cash flow, and the market value to change in the exchange rate. Now remember this, that these three components are the key function element of how we view the relative success or the failure of a multinational firm. This slide explains us about the foreign exchange risk explosives. Now, there are four different types of foreign exchange exposures. Number one is the transaction exposures, which means that the changes in the value of outstanding financial obligation incurred prior to change in exchange rate, but not due to be settled until after the exchange rate is changed. So, what is the transaction exposures? which is a big factor. Number two is operating exposures, which is also called the economic exposures. It basically measures the changes in the present value of firm resulting from any changes of expected future operating cash flows because of any unexpected changes in the exchange rate. Number three, is called the, trans the translation exposures. So this actually happens because of the accounting exposures or the potential accounting exposures or risk derived from the translation of the financial statement from one subsidiary to another subsidiary or from home country to another subsidiary. And the fourth exchange rate risk exposures includes the tax exposures because the tax rate of different countries are different. And sometimes to send the profit from one country to another country is also difficult. So if 
for a multinational corporation, one branch is one to send the profit to its home country that could it could face some difficulties. For example, some of the developing nations they have restrictions of sending foreign remittance to another country. So this is the tax exposure. So multinational corporation they face this four types of risk, which includes the trans transaction exposures, which is because of the happens because of the transactions. Second is the operating exposures because this is for the operational uh, ineffectiveness. Third is for the translation exposures, which is coming from the the translation of the financial statement. And the fourth one is the tax exposures, which is coming for uh, from the tax rate system uh, in different countries across the globe. So how do we hedge the foreign exchange market risk? How we reduce the foreign exchange market risk for the multinational corporation? As we know, hedging protects the owners of an asset for any future loss. So we try to do the hedging in order to reduce the losses. It also eliminates any gain from an increase in the value of an asset in future that we are hedging against. All right, so the hedging is an important factor for uh, the reduction of the risk in the market, but it also uh, eliminate any future gain. So we need to be very careful in the foreign exchange market in order to hedge, in order to use the hedging strategies. So in the foreign exchange market, and also for the multinational corporation, uh, they use different types of instrument in the market or the international market in order to raise the fund, uh, in order to do the deposit in the bank. Now, we need to know some of the key terms in order to understand this part. First of all, is called the euro dollar. So the euro dollar is a currency deposited in a bank outside the country of its origin. So the euro dollar is basically dominated in the US currency, but for example, it is deposited outside the uh, outside the US market. For example, the US dollar dominated deposit in Citibank London or US dollar dominated deposit in Tokyo, Japan. Or it could be euro in deposited in a, is a yen deposit held outside the Japan. So for example, euro yen deposited uh, in any European countries, for example, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, or a, in uh, the NetWest Bank, London. So that is called the euro dollar or the euro yen deposit. The second term is called the euro bond, now, which is a very important factor for the multinational corporation. So the euro bond is dominated in a currency other than the home currency of the country or the market which is issued. For example, US dollar dominated bond sold in the London bond market or yen dominated Japanese bond issued uh, sold in uh, the France. So that's called the euro bond. So the terms came from the word called euro. Euro means outside. So the outside of its own currency. So it doesn't mean that because it's a euro bond, it must be issued in Europe. So it's nothing to do with the Europe, Europe or the eurozone. So the euro came from the word that it is outside of the home currency. So any in the US dollar dominated bond sold in say for example Japan, for example in China, for example in the European Union, it would be the euro bond. The same way any Chinese currency bond sold in Japan or sold in US or sold in China, that would be a euro bond. So not so the euro bond not issue on a single national bond market. And also need to remember that the euro bond is not subject to the jurisdiction or the control of any country's regulatory authority because it's euros outside of the country. So, for
for the multinational corporation, the capital budgeting is also very important. Now, when we discuss about the Eurobond, why the Eurobond is important for the multinational corporation is because that if the multinational corporation need to raise the fund, they can use the Eurobond. They can use the Euro dollar in order to deposit the money in a particular financial institution. So, for the multinational corporation, the capital budgeting is absolutely very, very crucial thing. OECD finds that debt and equity in different countries is different. For example, Japan is 85 to 15, Germany is 65 to 35, and, Japan, uh, and USA is 50 to 15. Uh, so, a multinational corporation, it is absolutely difficult to determine what would be its uh, optimal debt and equity ratio or what would be the optimal capital structure. And different countries have different system. For example, gain tax is absent in Japan and Germany, where the investors prefer stock investment, which is different from Australia and the USA. Again, Japanese and German firms prefer bank loan, whereas the US and Australian firm they prefer return earning. So the capital budgeting for the multinational corporation is absolutely a critical factor. So they need to determine based on the country's structure, based on based on the country's uh, historical uh, practice, and that will determine the capital structure. So it might have different capital structure depending upon the location. And the same way, the cash management is also a very critical factor for the MNC. However, we need to understand that when you look into the working capital management lecture, that every organization would like to speed up the cash collection and delay the cash disbursement. Now, it's it is followed by the multinational corporation as well. So wherever you look in the cash management system, uh, every organization would like to speed up the collection of the cash and they would like to delay the payment of the cash. Now this is a practice of the multinational corporation as well. However, sometimes the MNC face problem in fund transfer among its branches in terms of currency restrictions. For example, from Bangladesh, there is, there is a restriction of sending money to its overseas branches. Any, there are several other emerging nations and the developing countries, they have such restrictions. So, MNC might face problem of fund transfer among its branches because of it is located across the globe. So MNC and credit management. So the credit management is often complex for multi multinational corporation as well than the local firm because granting trade credit is riskier uh, due to the devaluation currency risk and the time difference between the cash inflow and the receivables for the multinational corporation. And also, and also, MNC might face a problem uh, with the developing nation as the devaluation of the currency market eat some of the benefits. Interestingly, uh, some firms in Japan, they have a direct trade relationship with other companies which are located in other countries. And Japanese government provide assistance to the firms, to their firms to provide credit to the importers. And the next slide is about the inventory management and this is our last slide as well. The inventory management is often very complex for the multinational corporation because storing uh, the inventories across the different location of the globe is a very complex situation for the multinational corporation and it also carry a huge cost. So the, so the multinational corporation, they need to take a strategy that requires a huge investment in inventory and they need to make sure that they have the minimum cost in order to store the inventories. 
Sometimes few countries have the quota rate system where one country can send a specific amount of goods to another country and this might can also impact the inventory management of the multinational corporation and the taxation system can also affect the inventory management of large multinational corporation hopefully you like this lecture and thank you very much for listening and watching my video if you like it please do not forget to subscribe thank you